Hello. I came here this evening not really expecting to talk. I was just going to be a spectator like the rest of you. Um, but I just wanted, I'm Ann Zeta. I'm the city council representative for District 9, which this uh, project is located in. And um, I appreciate all the efforts of the people who participated over the last week. And I wish I could have participated more fully. I have a full-time job now. I think you all are aware of that. Um, I did want to mention um, someone that we lost this week, Sandra Dennehy, who was very involved in the Berry Street Initiative, which kicked off urban villages across the entire city of Fort Worth. And so we owe her a great deal of gratitude for the work that she has done over the years. Unfortunately, she was diagnosed with cancer um, not very long ago at all and passed away over the weekend. Um, there's going to be a service for her on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock at the Botanic Gardens in the Fuller Garden. Um, and she, I read last night at City Council in her honor an article that she wrote after um, participating in the Berry Street Initiative about citizens participation and a call to action basically at the end of her article about how if you care for the communities that you live in and the schools that your children attend and the air that you breathe, that there's, that it should be second nature to get involved. So I appreciate all of you for the involvement that you have given of your time to make our city a great place to live and work and play. And I will hand it over. Thanks, Amy. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lee Einsweiler. I work with a planning consulting firm out of Austin, Texas called Code Studio. Code Studio is uh, uh, under contract uh, here in the city of Fort Worth to um, do some work on the um, uh, Barry and University area in furtherance of the original uh, urban village plan. And we're going to show you some of that work this evening. This is uh, what we call a work in progress presentation. You should uh, accept that uh, these are the work that has occurred between Saturday morning when we consulted with the public, and now Wednesday night. So um, we've only had a few days to work through this, but I've had a whole variety of technical experts at my beck and call. We've had a lot of technical meetings, and um, uh, we think we've got a lot of it right. But it is not all set in stone, and certainly none of it is done yet. So uh, with that modest grain of salt, um, let me present some ideas. Um, this evening's presentation is going to include a, a, a recap of the charrette that we've been holding this week. Uh, it's going to include a little bit of background about the project, some information on the streetscape uh, that we're proposing, and some character areas that might eventually lead to being new zoning districts, some block studies in which we tested those character areas, and finally, a little bit about next steps. Uh, so um, let me share a couple of things with you. Uh, there are some goals for this project. That is to get this area ready for transit. Texrail is coming uh, to the uh, Barry Cleaver intersection, and uh, we ought to be developing in patterns that anticipate being a rail-centered area at some point in time. Neighborhood resiliency. Wow, uh, if you stopped and looked at the stormwater posters on the way in, you know we've got a significant stormwater problem. Those of you with uh, long memories will remember that there are times when Berry Street has three to five feet of water on top of it. Um, and the possibility of new zoning. These are all coming together uh, to make this project happen. So the partners in this project include a variety of people. First and foremost, North Central Texas Council of Governments in their uh, sustainable development program uh, funded this project. And they funded a grant to the city of Fort Worth and other involved partners include the T, uh, TCU, the Berry Street Initiative has been involved. But I have to give special thanks this week uh, to TCU for providing us a home for the week. Uh, we were here in the ACUF room for the majority of the time. We borrowed the clink scale room uh, for much of the time. We actually uh, had an additional room for lunch and learns that we used. And finally, uh, uh, we got a chance to bike around the area with courtesy of the folks from B-Cycle. So for a nominal fee, B-Cycle basically gave us unlimited bike use this week. And you'll see we took our bikes around the neighborhood to start as a great way to sort of uh, get our feet on the ground and uh, uh, learn about this place. 
So here is our project area, and the reason this project area is drawn is for the most part, we're dealing with the commercial zoning that sits along Berry Street. But the project area is extended in a couple of directions to capture certain kinds of things. We're coming a little bit down Cleburne Road because we're trying to capture that zigzag pattern along there and think about how development should occur there. Um, uh, we're coming down as far as the Kroger uh, over here. We follow the commercial zoning on University. And we've really just included one block uh, around that uh, down to uh, DeWitt on the bottom and uh, Bowie on the top there. So there is a parallel project going on called the Zoo Creek uh, uh, Flood Mitigation Study, which is looking at the overall stormwater watershed here and trying to figure out how we can dry the place up a little bit. Now, the fact of the matter is it's very clear from previous studies that it would take an enormous amount of money to build a huge pipe through the area and just shoot all the water at the zoo. Um, that's one possible solution. It's a very expensive one, and of course, the conveyance of water into the zoo property wouldn't make the zoo very happy. So they are, this time around, looking at some more, uh, a, a greater variety of smaller scale solutions, and you'll see some of those embedded in the show tonight. But there is a parallel study. Uh, get engaged as that comes forward. Um, that will be talking strictly about the stormwater policy for the area. Our charrette team that's here this evening uh, includes my firm, Code Studio, uh, which includes uh, Colin Scarf uh, and Megan, where'd Me Megan Scornia. Um, in addition to our firm, our lead designers from Third Coast Design Studio, uh, Keith Covington and Lee Jones. Uh, our stormwater uh, partners from Half Associates, Francois is here, Terry's here, Ben's here. Um, uh, our market analyst is back in Austin. He's given us his stuff and gone home. Our landscape architects are still here from uh, Steve Birkenbile and Don Bounce. Where'd Don go? There's Don. Uh, uh, our public outreach group is here as well. Uh, Janaba is here this evening uh, helping us. Thank you, Janaba. And uh, finally, we have a transportation and parking expert in DeShazo Group. So um, we have a full team of people who have basically worked through uh, since Friday afternoon uh, to get here to Wednesday night. Um, as you'll see, we met with a whole variety of people during the course of this week. Some of you may have dropped in on the Open Design Studio. Uh, all of this work happened very transparently in um, uh, rooms right here where people could drop through and see what's going on and respond to our ideas as they were created. Um, there's our uh, starting bike tour for you. Uh, uh, there's Artie from the city looking good, the, our super vato. And uh, uh, it, was, it was absolutely awesome to tour around on bikes, I gotta tell you. The nice thing is that uh, these bikes are a real leveler. It doesn't matter what your skill level is, they're a little wobbly, so. Um, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, on Saturday, we held our design workshop right here in this room. They pulled the seats back for us and uh, uh, we ran four big tables of, of people talking about this. For those of you who were looking at the material up front, here's the four table drawings that were created during the course of that. And uh, from that came, uh, sorry, here's a, a, a set of the issues that we asked them about. Um, we were asking about things that need to be preserved, things that need to be changed, uh, things you're not happy with in the neighborhood, um, uh, and uh, specifically some questions about the zoning in the area so that when we get to that, um, we'll have a chance to think about changing the zoning. Um, the actual maps there. Um, and just some of the ideas that came out of it. Um, uh, there were a lot of ideas about um, uh, Westbury and, and trying to um, uh, deal with the perception of crime there, trying to get more eyes on the street, a more activity, trying to encourage the students and uh, the community to uh, embrace the corridor. Um, the residential areas adjacent to it, um, some challenging problems like sidewalk connections and the uh, student housing which has popped up in the area, some of the over parking challenges. So um, we heard from a variety of people um, uh, the same kinds of things. In the afternoon on Saturday after the charrette, we were uh, lucky enough that um, uh, our council member uh, talked to the, um, uh, really one of the nation's foremost uh, experts on pedestrianism into stopping by. So the Blue Zones project includes Dan Burden, that's the uh, gentleman in the, uh, in the brown vest on the top, 
um, with that Fraggle Rock look. Um, and uh, uh, Dan happens to be um, uh, one of the absolute best at something called a walking audit. And he walked people up and down the corridor and helped them understand what some of the opportunities were uh, for this corridor. On Saturday, we began our brainstorming. And um, uh, you can see some of the initial pieces uh, that were worked on uh, up here on the walls. The more formal concept as those ideas sort of solidified over time. Uh, we moved on from that brainstorming uh, to running the open design studio. Um, many people dropped in during the course of the week. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we met a lot of interesting people who have um, uh, property in the area and concerns about the area. The design studio included uh, Lunch and Learn. On Monday, the Lunch and Learn was on economics, and on Tuesday, on stormwater. Both well attended, uh, both uh, very interesting sessions. Um, we also had a series of stakeholder meetings with the technical stakeholders, like the folks who control the roads, the folks who deal with stormwater, um, uh, and uh, the folks who deal with the zoning. Series of initial concepts came out of that. Those concepts are on the wall here. If anybody wants to look at those original uh, concepts as they were first drawn and annotated, we've included a few of them in the show just to be a reminder. So we worked up some initial concepts, and on Monday night, uh, there was a drop-in open house held right here. We pinned most of that stuff up on the walls, and we asked people, what do you think? Here's the initial concepts. Are we on the right track? Have we been listening? And um, I think for the most part, we did pretty well. We had a, a significant number of comments on our uh, character drawing. And for those of you who might have seen the first version, this version's a modified version. And you'll see we were uh, responsive to many of the questions about uh, uh, could we um, find some imagery that had better character that was closer uh, to what people felt the concept was. Um, we spent the last couple of days trying to refine that work. And in fact, uh, today, um, we, uh, we <laughs> they worked, the team worked quite late last night. I'm allowed to sleep because all I do is talk. So I get to go home. I can't draw a lick. Um, so they worked late last night in preparation. And uh, uh, today, we actually were doing our production work. <laughs> we didn't have our room upstairs, and so this uh, space right here had all of those tables and everything else in it, and uh, the production team moved downstairs. And thank heavens for computers, because if we'd had to color it all, we wouldn't have had enough time and not enough room. So, a little bit of background on the project area. Um, I guess uh, it's important that we all stay grounded in market reality. So, our economist um, uh, basically came forward and uh, shared some information with the community the other day. That uh, show is up on the website if you want to have a look at that. Um, I've excerpted it here with um, uh, some of what I think are the key ideas. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, uh, this area has what the, the uh, retail folks call leakage. You have not only stormwater leakage, but you have retail leakage. Leakage means the money that we expect you to be spending is not being spent here. Because we can look at the revenues from the places that are here, and they don't equal what you, as a group, by, based on your demographics, ought to be spending. That means you're going somewhere else, and the money is leaking out of the neighborhood. So there's a huge opportunity associated with leakage to simply bring that money back to the neighborhood. It's not that there isn't enough money here altogether. It's that you're spending it in other places. So some of the <coughs> ideas uh, indicate maybe some opportunities to stop some of that leakage. Some of it is clearly going to leave. We're not talking about building a Costco in the corridor, right? You know, so those of you who need Costco or Sam's or whatever it happens to be are going to go somewhere else for that and continue to do that. But <clears throat> can we capture some of the other things? Can we capture perhaps some more of the eating and drinking? Can we capture some of the other ideas uh, that are, are uh, uh, missing uh, out of the area? So there are 110 individual businesses in the project area. Uh, 37 of them happen to be eating and drinking establishments. Six of those are freestanding fast food establishments. There's 27 retail stores. Uh, there's five vacant retail stores. And there are 13, and there's a reason for those quotes, uh, alternative financial institutions in the corridor, mostly in the eastern end of the corridor. The challenge is, if you actually looked behind the corporate veil of those 13, they are probably fairly consolidated. 
There is a limit in Texas on how long a payday loan can be held by a certain entity, and it is common practice to say, oh, your however many days are up. Let me introduce you to somebody else, and to walk behind the curtain and come back out with a different hat on and lend the money at your next business. So it is possible, quite possible, that there are actually less than 13 business people here engaged in this market um, uh, of, of payday and title loan, et cetera. But here's how it maps out, and I'll apologize that we'll have better maps for these eventually. These were done by our economist, and as he admitted, he is not the GIS expert. So there's at least one pin completely out of place, and you'll all see it there. <clears throat> the retail is not down there on, on uh, uh, I guess that's on Benbrook. Um, so that pin is clearly supposed to be two blocks north somewhere. But the retail is fairly well spread out along the corridor. Eating and drinking is somewhat concentrated in a couple of areas. It's the faster food kinds of things on the eastern end and the more sit down kinds of things a little bit to the west. The financial products range, however, between Bank of America on the one end to all of those alternative financial uh, uh, opportunists on the eastern end of the corridor. So uh, there's, there's quite a variety of uh, things like that. There is one alternative uh, financial user right in the middle uh, as well. So that's kind of some of the, the, the picture. It all adds up to the fact that there are sort of three characters from the economist's perspective of, of what's going on in this corridor and its kind of function. And we've called them for the moment college town transitional and I've called it east-west berry. That's not what the economist called it if you saw the lunch and learn show, I renamed it. So let's just talk about those three areas a little bit. So College Town, if you built suitable spaces, you could attract typical college retailers that are not here now. Those might be the Gap or Urban Outfitters, other kinds of preppy kinds of places, fashionable independent stores. Uh, the example he uses is Colwell, uh, uh, which is probably a really good example from your neighboring community. Um, however, there are limited opportunities for that development, right? There are small parcels that are shallow on the south side of Barrie. The university owns much of the land on the north side of Barrie. So the potential for growth is really somewhere else, either further east or to the side streets. The transitional area, the center area there, has its own challenges. Uh, right now it has a number of drive through facilities. It has two dueling drugstores, which our economists suggest has to shake out sometime soon. This drugstore on every corner model cannot survive. Um, uh, the notion of a performing arts center for the university would clearly attract new visitors. And the transit that's proposed, along with some stormwater improvements, would help jumpstart development. But that's all outside investment. That's university investment, the T's investment, or some other private investor working with the T. Um, the stormwater improvements perhaps coming from the city. So the opportunity for right now in much of the eastern end of the corridor is to outfunk Magnolia, right? Those of you who've been here a long time, tell me what was the first, first, first start of Magnolia being a cool place to be? Anybody? Okay, good example. Um, so we need the first example of that, right? Nominal investment in an existing building. This one happens to be from another city here in Texas, but not in Alabama. Um, uh, but nominal investment in a building happens to be attractive, you know, serves great food, you know, perhaps serves great beer, whatever. Um, uh, this is one of the opportunities for this corridor in the short term, is, is to bring in that community that brings a little life and vibrancy um, anybody here to live in Ryan Place? There's a few. So how do we get people from Ryan Place down to the Berry Street Corridor? That's the fundamental question, right? We've got to grow Ryan Place down to the south. We've got to make that investment that's happened there bigger. Um, so east-west Berry, once you get east of Cleburne, it's even tougher. There is today just about zero market over there. There's not a lot of demand for a whole lot of things. Why is that? Because the value of the housing stock in the immediately surrounding area is very modest. Very, very modest. You have a pool of affordable housing there. So that gives us, in many people's minds, opportunity. 
Um, uh, large parcels can probably be assembled, um, but that redevelopment is going to take some substantial interventions. Things like the rail coming, stormwater mitigation happening, perhaps some investment in neighborhood amenities. Needs to be something that actually draws people to want to be there. So nominal investment in the existing buildings is kind of the pattern that the economist sees uh, for that portion of the corridor for now. On the other hand, for those of you who might be familiar with Austin, where I'm from, uh, East 6th Street, East 7th Street, East Cesar Chavez, etc., were all run down, empty storefronts in ethnic neighborhoods the same way that this one is, and now they are, you know, the hippest place in the city to be. That won't last long, but uh, they'll move on to somewhere else. But in the meantime, those uh, market forces are helping raise uh, all the boats in that surrounding area. So if I was to just talk about sort of what are the forces that are operating in this area that we have to think about as we're planning it. Certainly we're sitting in the middle of one, TCU, right? Significant investor in the neighborhood. Um, they are the ones who pay to maintain the streetscape that's here. They are a good civic partner for this community. We have the T as a possible significant investor in the future of this neighborhood in selecting this Texrail station and uh, setting us up. We have the eastern portion of the corridor with this more casual approach to investment uh, of, of simply reinventing the existing buildings that are there. But all of that, all of that gets a little smackdown. There's our smackdown right there. That's the 100 year inundation boundary of, uh, that is the inundation boundary of a 100 year storm. So that's not necessarily deep water, but it's some water, and some of it is deep. I'll show you a little bit later where the deep places are. So this is a huge challenge in terms of redevelopment. You can see why the western portion of the corridor is doing better than some of these other pieces. They've got stormwater issues, and they're going to continue to have stormwater <coughs> issues. And the stormwater environment, in terms of permitting with the city and all those kinds of things, is just going to get tougher. It's just going to get tougher. So, here's the stormwater. Those darker blues are the depth. And actually, uh, at CVS there, uh, the depth is three to five feet uh, of water sitting over the road. A significant problem. The worst problem is that if I just look at my study area, if I look at the face of Berry Street alone, I can't fix the problem. Because it's all happening upstream, meaning south of there on the map and it's all flowing through my study area, a raging river created upstream flowing through the study area, right? So part of the question of resolving the new zoning and the new thinking for this area is how to accommodate this kind of movement of water through the project area. In a storm which provides an inch and a quarter of rain in an hour, the water stays in the pipe underground. The minute we get a storm more intense then an inch and a quarter an hour, the water flows over the ground throughout the project area. So, let's talk about how some of the improvements to this area might be a help. First off, the streetscape. Now, right now, you have a great new streetscape on the western end of Berry Street. But when this streetscape was designed, it was not set up to be a stormwater streetscape. These uh, planting beds are raised. You can see the water not going into them right there in the lower left. Um, uh, so while they handle a little water that lands on them, they are not intended to handle anything more than that. But it's a pretty good streetscape. I've walked that street, it feels pretty good. It's uh, you know, not half bad. It's certainly an improvement over the sections that don't have any streetscape. So what we really need to do is extend that streetscape and get it all the way to Cleburne. The third phase, two phases have been built already, the third phase is necessary. So this is a simple schematic design of that third phase. You're seeing the uh, parallel parking spaces, the bump outs, the uh, curb extensions that help us get across the street, uh, the enhanced pattern uh, within the, the uh, intersections to uh, begin to give people a perception that the traffic should be slowed down. And that would get us um, uh, all the way to Cleburne with that streetscape. It'd be great if we could simply extend it. But better yet, if in doing that, we could do a better job. 
So we have shown also a piece uh, east of Cleburne running all the way to uh, about just past 6th Street where the uh, road dives underneath the railroad track. There's two options shown here. One option we couldn't resist was a little reverse parking option. We can actually keep the four lanes of traffic, not all six that are there, but we've choked it down to four lanes further on, so we can choke it down here as well. So the four lanes of traffic, right, uh, in a model in which the center line is actually shifted to the north, we fit in a median, and we can get angled parking in. Angled parking would be really helpful for the adjacent buildings because some of the problem with the reuse of those buildings is the perception that they don't have access to parking. Now, they may not need significant access to parking, but parking out front is what every retailer wants. Parking space is right out front. Now, unfortunately, when we actually, once we had designed this and figured it out, it only gives you two extra parking spaces per block over a parallel parking model. So it's not super productive. Uh, it's not like it's giving us a ton of stuff. And it's one-sided. So in that sense, it's biased. So uh, the lower drawing is uh, an example with the parallel parking spaces. We lose two of the spaces that we'd included. We get 12 spaces per block instead of 14. But probably it operates better. But one of the key things that we're really talking about here uh, is that we're using a stormwater set of planters. And so what you'll see here is a redesign which has, uh, as an example, the uh, uh, sidewalk water running off. Um, you'll see the little curb there is set there, but the uh, level of the ground is below that, and the curb is actually cut. I'll show you some pictures in a minute of what this might look like. The water goes in, it sits in a filter bed. If we only have a little bit, it's contained there. If we have a lot of it, it goes on down through, and it goes through the pipe that's in the little square underneath, and it actually goes into the storm system, right? Same thing with the center lane. Two center lanes are going in, and then the other two lanes, the outside lane and the parking lane, uh, going into the curbside rain gardens. So a series of rain gardens that are actually helping us solve the problem right here within our streetscape. What might that look like? Here's some ideas. Um, heaven knows what those might actually formally look like. We're not designing anything in any rigorous way here. But these are some examples of what that streetscape looks like. Fundamentally, what you're talking about is uh, cutting the uh, curb. You'll see the little metal panel here in the top left corner. Or uh, down here, you'll see the metal panels cutting back through. Each of those is a channel in which the water is flowing back down into the filtration bed. When that filtration bed is full of water, it ends up in the pipe down below. So those are the kinds of ideas that could be included in the streetscape. And in fact, over time, I would hope that we might be able to retrofit the existing streetscape to also help us do this job. But certainly the first step is those future portions of the streetscape need to be stormwater enhanced. So once we get the street going and have that right, then what is the character of the private development in the area? So when we started thinking about that, as many of you know, uh, we started with these sort of softly bounded areas that are seen here. When the urban designers look at this stuff, when the planners talk about it, we're kind of looking for areas with a consistent character either today or an anticipated consistent character in the future. And fundamentally, the biggest game changer in this area is the new transit station. And so uh, first and foremost, we're talking about What's going to happen uh, near that train station? We also have this other spot right here, the other star there. That's where the deepest water is along Berry Street. So how can we be sensitive to the amount of conveyance that has to happen in that area to move water through so it's not piled up over Berry Street? So those are some of the ideas that we're working with. And one of the things that we found during the course of this is that at least for the planning process, we've extended our boundary. You can see these circles. The circle is a quarter mile uh, or a five minute walk from the transit station. The second circle is a 10 minute walk, a half mile. And what we decided is that we really ought to come over and talk about how to resolve some of the issues on the east side of Cleburne. So we've gone a little bit deeper into the neighborhood. That's where that dotted line comes from, is uh, that it helps us uh, design some solutions that make sense on that eastern side as well. So, Let's walk through some of these character areas. Um, uh, the first one we're showing is what we call Westbury Shopfront. 
It includes the little piece along university that has Witch Witch and Duchess and all of that, and it extends uh, on university over to Lubbock. Um, so it includes the front of all of those parcels. It's the red piece that you see on that map. What kind of character would that area have? Well, we think that it is a shop front area. This is our core retail zone. That means the buildings need to be set up for retail use. Pulled up to the street, lots of glass on the ground floor. Uh, upper story can be office, residential. Three to four stories maximum. That's all that fits on these sites. You cannot build taller on these sites. They are too shallow. So unless we were extending the zoning down to the south into the neighborhood, this is the kind of heights that you might expect in the buildings. And uh, frankly, we can barely squeeze in the three stories. The four goes on the deepest lots. The next piece that we're showing, we've called North Berry for the moment. Um, this is the area where private uh, institutions, uh, I know there's a lawyer there, there's a liquor store there, there's some other uh, private uses there, there's a gas station there today. There's as well a lot of university ownership and there'll be some institutional future in this area. So in some sense, it's a combination of sort of civic entities, the big institutional buildings, as well as retail entities. And so we're gonna see horizontal mixed use, meaning adjacent to each other, and we might see some vertical mixed use, institutional, retail, office, residential. On that side of Barry, we would anticipate five to six stories. It doesn't abut single family residential, it's the right place to put intensity that doesn't impact immediately on single family neighborhoods. There's a civic zone, which includes the church and the high school, and uh, that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, I, um, I don't think anyone would challenge us that yes, that's uh, civic, and yes, we'd like to keep it civic. We'd like to have both the church and the high school stay. The next piece is what we call TOD mixed use. So this is a zone that really kicks in when the train station comes, right? Activating it far in advance of the train station is tough. The development community wants to see that investment in the train happen first. We all know the rail line is there, it's not moving anywhere, but are we really, really, really getting the station or not? All those questions are out there, and until the development community is really convinced it's happening, they're likely to be a bit reluctant to develop. But we want the tools in place to develop and redevelop these sites in a way that anticipates transit in the future. That means slightly more intense development. And again, most of this does not sit up against single family neighborhoods. That's part of the reason we're comfortable with that level of intensity. So five to six stories in this area as well, mixed use shop front, apartments, townhouses, horizontal and vertically mixed use, retail, office, residential. In this area right here, which is behind the TOD uh, uh, piece, this is uh, the station that sits uh, right in that empty quadrant to the northeast of this yellow color. Uh, we've called this TOD residential. This is not necessarily a full-on commercial area because it's embedded back south of the station area, but it is likely to intensify over time. TODs are places where we see three to four story intense development. So we're showing here apartment, townhouse, live work, mixed residential, some limited retail and office. You could see that perhaps in a large building like this, we could have a coffee shop in a corner. We might have an office uh, embedded on the ground floor, but not an entire uh, mixed use shop front throughout the area. Uh, three to four story maximum starting to taper off towards the neighborhood. So the TOD itself is at five to six. We're now down to three to four. You'll see in a moment we taper back down below that. The west bear, sorry, the east west berry shop fronts. Uh, again, this is a shop front retail area. We hope in the future much more neighborhood serving, right? Much more associated with the development immediately north and south. In this area, really the focus is on reusing those existing buildings. Uh, uh, ground floor, office and retail, upper story, office and residential, two to three stories maximum in this project area. Again, shallow parcels, not a whole lot of opportunity for substantial height. The Cleburne shop front, this is the challenging piece. You have a front door or a back door, we're not quite certain. You have the back facing Cleburne, but that's where the most of the traffic is, but you can't have an entrance on that side. The entrance is off the side street, but is that really the back? It faces the neighborhood, the traffic isn't really there, so the sign's out on the other side. This stuff can't decide whether to be beast or foul. It's really challenged. And uh, so some thinking about how those parcels might work better. 
Um, uh, mixed use shop fronts, it's clearly retail, ground floor retail and office, upper story office and residential. Again, because of the size of the par parcels, two to three stories maximum. This area is called transitional residential for a reason. So um, we have certainly heard an awful lot about the TCU overlay during the course of this week. Wow, um, can of worms. So you're all working on that. I understand that the uh, citywide parking change, which is an important part of solving the problem, has gotten through the Planning Commission. Hopefully we'll get through the council soon. It, but there's another piece to follow on, which is the question of the number of people that can live, who are unrelated, that can live in a house together. So uh, in our experience in lots and lots of other communities, um, while that may help, one of the real challenges is actually the impact of that development. It's the quality of development itself. It is where the parking is located. It is how the site is laid out. What we have developed is an idea that says, this is a market pressure in this area. Um, uh, we are not going to meet the needs right now with the new dorm construction that's going on. Once that is completed, TCU will have 60% of its student body housed on campus. What's that mean? That means 4,000 students are housed off campus. And that's gonna continue for a while until there's more on-campus housing. And even when there is all the on-campus housing in the world, if there were 10,000 units on campus, you would still see students off campus, right? Because that's a matter of choice. And some people would prefer to live in a neighborhood than in the dorm on campus. So even were the university to reach their maximum building, we need a place for some more intense kinds of housing. So part of the challenge with the areas along the corridor are that they have the backs of commercial development. Not only do they have the back, they have no alley or service. They back right up to the houses. There is no separation in between the commercial development and the houses. So this zone, this zone is designed to solve a variety of problems all at once. It solves, it serves as a land use transition from the corridor itself, stepping down to the single family neighborhood. It serves as a possible future place to put student housing or at least more intense housing products that are different from the single family neighborhoods. And so here we've shown some examples, townhouse, courtyard apartments, small apartments, mixed residential setting, two to three stories maximum. Okay? This is not some of the large buildings that have been built there already. It's a variety of smaller kinds of buildings. However, it relies on us making sure that these have green front yards. We do that by making sure that we activate the rear alleys in those blocks. We need to activate both the commercial alley as a T across the block and the residential alley going north-south and provide the parking in the rear. Um, making sure that we have the right amount of parking on site associated with the number of bedrooms in the unit will help a whole lot and the new change to the standards will help with that. In addition, there are a couple of other additional small pieces. Um, there are much more um, uh, challenging, um, modest pieces down here in the southwest corner of the project area. And one of them is sort of a neighborhood commercial area. Um, it includes the Kroger site, which is quite large scale, and some smaller scale sites. In that area, we see a, a, a response in which there's a combination of things happening. Um, you might see three to four stories out towards Barrie and two to three stories as you taper off towards the neighborhood. So we've shown an image here on the left-hand side of how that can play out. This is actually a significant uh, building as though it were out towards Barrie and on University and then stepping down to the lower scale building uh, and eventually clearly the University steps down to a model which is more townhouse in, in character. So this is the start of that. The end of that is, uh, sorry, another piece is back behind the Kroger, there's a series of residential buildings that actually face that development, right? And, and that's a challenging place to be on that north end of Rogers Avenue, right? So right now what we're suggesting is that we take the uh, kinds of things that are allowed in that transitional residential area, but we actually give them a few more uses. So there might be uh, individual single family homes in there today, which could be limited retail or office in the future. The idea being, if you've got to look at that big commercial agglomeration that sits across the street, 
we need a more different variety of uses. It's not going to be a quiet single family neighborhood on that piece of Rogers Avenue because of the intensity of development next door. Let's all admit it and let's put some uses in there that can have the right form and character, uh, less intense, tapering off to the neighborhood, but can contain some of the kinds of uses that would like to be there. The final piece of the puzzle is stepping that piece down into the single family neighborhood. We've called this university residential. By that, we don't mean TCU, we mean University Avenue, University Drive, sorry. Uh, so it, this is really a set of townhouses which are reaching down that street uh, towards Blue Bonnet. Um, uh, and uh, here, really limiting them to two to three stories, fully residential, not allowing the commercial to creep on down the roadway. So that's the final piece of the puzzle. So those are the character areas. And in order to understand those character areas, it's really not fair for the planners just to get out their colors and you know, kind of look at an aerial photo and ride our bikes around the neighborhood and then color some stuff and all go home. That's not fair. We spend a lot of time talking to our economists, we talk to our transportation guys, and then we let loose the landscape architects and the architects, the urban design team, on these areas, and they generate something called a block study. The block studies are here, so here's the project area that we're going to show you. Someone asked me earlier what's short term and what's long term. Uh, short term is soon, and um, long term's a while from now. <laughs> um, let's put it this way long term relies in these images on us being real certain the train's coming, right? These ideas are around the train station, and you'll see some of them in a moment. So right now, here's the area. We have Cleburne, the train line, flooding, uh, massive parking lots, single family neighborhoods. That's really what's in this image today. That's what I see as a planner when I look at this aerial photo. So what's the first step that needs to be done? Well, in order to make this area appealing to the development community, we've got to, in essence, dry it up. We've got to figure out a way to start tackling the stormwater problems here. And unfortunately, tackling those stormwater problems, a lot of that has to happen upstream from here. So there may be development, act there may be activity in improving the stormwater channelization and other kinds of things up uh, further up in the watershed. But there clearly needs to be some activity here. Uh, the station area, for those of you uh, uh, who s can see it, the clear piece uh, right there that sits up against Cleburne uh, that has no houses on it is the future station area. So what might it look like in the short term? Well, everything that's a little black footprints in existing building, and we're simply showing some examples of what might happen. In the short term, in the next five to 10 years, what's coming? Maybe a few little projects. There might be a little housing project. There might be some retail on the face of the school if we could get the school board to lease it to us. Um, wouldn't it be great to provide some eating choices other than the fast food across the street to the students? Um, wouldn't it be great to have some activity near Cleburne there? Um, uh, some things other than what's there that start to set the form and character for the future. And then we're showing the station area uh, as having its initial investment, which is a transfer station, which allows for the buses to come through the area, allows for kiss and ride drop off, uh, and eventually then will become the station area. But we're also showing some important elements here. And that is we're showing the way the water moves through this project area because it's going to move through this project area until we get into the upper portions of the watershed and invest enough to actually dry these places up. So in the meantime, um, uh, we've got to deal with things like this soccer field, the park that's shown here, and the conveyance uh, that you see through the area. And what might that look like? Well, here's some of the ideas. Um, uh, this is a beautiful stormwater facility that allows us to have a soccer field in an area that could really use an open field, an open opportunity like this. Now, uh, uh, this lower example happens to be from uh, here in the city of Fort Worth. In fact, it's not terribly far away from here. It's got conveyance on the left-hand side. It's really channelized. And when that conveyance is full of water, the water comes up and fills the soccer field. It's a very simple, simple, simple system. And in fact, the image on the top, which happens to be in Laurel, Mississippi, designed by the famous landscape designer Olmsted, 
uh, is a perfect example of one of these from 1910 or 1920. It's not like this stuff is new ideas. This is not all reliant on, on scientific solutions. You need to pour the water somewhere, here's a good spot, pour some water in, right? That's the kind of model that we're looking at for this idea. There's another idea here which says you might actually have a dry area that ponds up. Uh, it sits for much of the season as uh, something relatively dry, but uh, we're showing this little park as having that bridge for a reason because at a certain point in time, it's gonna be full of water. In a big rainstorm, two inches in an hour, three inches in an hour, that pond is gonna fill up. And that will allow us to slow some of the water down. And if we slow some down, then the pipes can carry a lot of the rest. When the pipes have emptied themselves out, we pour the pond back out into the pipes. It's a fairly, again, a fairly simple system of conveyance. Here, we're talking about moving the water around the building. And here are some physical examples of what that might look like. It can be a very elegant landscaped area, but you have to leave room for it. You have to actually have space adjacent to the building where that water can move. Otherwise, it's gonna come up against your building, and if you built your building up, it's gonna bounce off and flood your neighbor, right? So your choices are flood yourself, flood your neighbor, or leave a little room for it, please. So in the short term, we would see a combination of those ideas coming together to try and actually successfully slow down some of the water as it's moving through the area and uh, do a more effective job of not uh, flooding the zoo quite so badly. So what happens in the long term? Well, when is the long term? Okay, 20 years, 30 years, it's a long time away. Don't think of these as anything more than ideas about how that future development might fit on the ground and what its intensity might be. We might get one project in 20 years. We might get lucky and the train really spurs things and gas prices are through the roof and transportation downtown is impossible and all of a sudden the train is very appealing and we might get all of it. Never quite know. What might it look like? Well, here is the station area now with a mixed-use development, a shared parking garage, mixed-use along the main street, uh, mostly residential coming back down. We have actually shown a roundabout here uh, at uh, um, uh, Benbrook that uh, solves the problem of the multiple streets coming in there at different angles, right? You'd really love Benbrook to be a nice square intersection, but it's never going to be. Right, so we've actually run the train right through the roundabout, and we can pour the remaining portion of the roundabout full of water. It can be one of those places that can hold water instead of just being pavement, which most of it is today. We've also shown substantial residential occurring on the other side of the street, and as you can see, when these larger scale buildings come along Cleburne, they have a much better pattern of development you have much less of that small development with its butt end towards the houses immediately across the street. It's something that rethinks those block patterns and actually drops out some streets in favor of more consolidated blocks so you get more significant development. And the trade-off for that uh, open space, the detention pond, the storm, uh, water soccer field, all of that is clearly that slightly more intense development that comes adjacent to it. Uh, so it works hand in hand. We can't get there without the kind of money generated by this kind of development. So some of those ideas, as they might come forward, uh, here in the upper right, you see a roundabout that uh, is actually uh, got water in it. Um, you see a very urban setting here in the lower uh, uh, image and in the upper image in which you actually have wet storm ponds in which we retain water for a substantially longer period of time. We use uh, something like the bubbler or fountain that's seen there to aerate the water and keep the water quality high. This is an area which is not just conveying the water through the project area, but is actually holding on to water over that longer term. So, what does this uh, uh, idea of residential transition look like? This is one of the biggest challenges. So if we don't get this one right, we're gonna continue to have this strife between commercial development and immediately adjacent single family houses, between the single family neighborhoods and the student housing problem, the you know, sort of sense of cancer popping up throughout the neighborhoods. And if we can resolve this, we can get a great living area for people 
and a tolerable transition between the existing neighborhoods. And so what we're showing here is that uh, we can do this in a variety of ways and in a very piecemeal basis, right? There is a housing type there shown with two attached units. And uh, later on, if you want to have a look at it, they're uh, shown here on this smaller image. So after the show, you can come up and have a look. But two attached units together, uh, basically a duplex unit that fits on what is today a single family lot, 55 foot wide lot. So we're doubling the intensity, right? But it serves as a good buffer against the adjacent development. If you have one more lot, you might be able to do some more townhouses, or you might be able to build a courtyard development. And if you get enough land, you might actually be able to build uh, a court like this, which might run through the whole block. The idea here, and when you look at these housing types and the way that they meet the street, the idea is that the ends of the buildings function a little bit more like a steady pattern of individual houses. You're not seeing one long blank wall along there. You're not seeing uh, is it university houses wall. You're not seeing loft views wall. You're seeing something that seems like a pattern of original houses that might have been there. And if we can make that change, if we can make sure that the front yard remains green by activating the alley and providing all of the parking off of the alley, these are the kinds of things that they make this a much more tolerable neighbor than what we have today. Um, one final idea that we managed to just sneak into the show, thank you, Keith, um, how to deal with the Kroger in its future incarnation. This is a very sensitive area, right? You know, it, it, it is immediately in the midst of some very high quality housing. It's immediately at the gateway to the university. It is in a key, key location. The Kroger is physically on the wrong spot on the site. That's a suburban Kroger in an urban setting. Yes, the bank sits in front of it, but it doesn't help a whole lot. What you have is a big parking lot and then the Kroger back in the back. And some brilliant things were done at the time of the Kroger approval, right? The loading was put on the street side, which I guess got it out of the neighborhood, but now when you drive down University, you see all the loading bays. It's not quite right. The diverter that's back behind, great idea, keep the trucks out of the neighborhood, et cetera, but is the diverter really working for all of us? Is the pattern of traffic there actually helpful or not? So there are some questions about how that site ought to redevelop in the longer run. The intensity should be on the front of the block, right? Can we all agree the intensity goes up at Berry Street? So what we've shown here is the Kroger footprint with a liner set of buildings, so a little set of shops that would actually face Berry, the Kroger on the opposite side. The Kroger's entrance is on that central street and there's actually a parking garage right across the way. You park on the ground floor of the parking garage and you walk in just like it was a surface parking lot. It happens to have additional levels of parking if you need them, but those levels of parking serve four-story or three-story residential along the side, tapering down to two-story and tapering down to the townhouse district that we propose to the south. So this idea has, remember, to the west, we are taking those houses and saying they can be a little more intense they could have the chiropractor in them, they might have the massage therapist in them, they might have the accountant or the CPA, the whoever over on the west, hand, the west side of the site, and the townhouses to the south, blending in more uh, to the existing neighborhood than today. In addition, we would really, really, really like to see you streetscape all the way down to the circle. The streetscape within the university, the beautiful block of magnificent trees and streetscaping where 250 feet of lawn open up inside the university makes this world-class. That's a world-class physical space to stand in. And then go a couple of blocks south on the same street and it's not quite so world-class anymore. So can't we extend some of that thinking and some of that beauty on down the street? This is just a cross-section of what we possibly could do in that street, and I apologize, we missed getting our uh, other diagram and we'll slip it into the show before we post it so that you can see it. But the idea is that we can get both a median and the existing lanes and a better street tree and a better sidewalk in on this street. 
There is enough room for all of those things we believe. Running all the way down to the circle, there is room enough around the circle to actually create a green planted lawn on the outside and we should go back and plant the same kind of lawn on the inside to have that great feeling of trees all the way around that circle would be fabulous. So there's a real opportunity here. This also happens to be one of the early hippest places you've got, right? It's still kind of morphing a little bit, but it is a model for sort of casually reusing existing buildings, trying to get them going, trying to get the quality up um, uh, and, and change to happen in the neighborhood to match more successfully the kinds of businesses that serve the surrounding area. So some great businesses in there now, I'm hoping that they thrive, but they could be supported by a better streetscape. So one last idea that I wanna leave with you, and that is um, places like Austin have had immense success with these kinds of actions that are simply tactical, one-time, quick, easy interventions. It could be trailers, and it could be food trucks, it could be pop-up retail, it could be pop-up events, it could be movies in the park, it can be all kinds of things. But we need to start doing some of those, not here on the university campus, which is already in pretty good physical urban shape, but we need to start doing some of these things in other locations. Could we get something going on the tease site? It's empty, it has no trees on it. Could we get a blow up movie theater screen and go down there and show a movie in the middle of the summer? Let's go do it, right? Let's just do it on a Wednesday night in the middle of everything else, right? So some of these kinds of tactical ideas, reusing and rethinking the streets, uh, thinking about how street furniture and small places can be wondrous things. There's a great example of a neighborhood cleaning up an alley and one empty lot in Cincinnati. And every weekend, a different microbrew company comes and serves beer. It turns into a little beer garden and everybody comes down, pays $5 for a cup and wanders in and they all hang around and have a beer. Those kinds of neighborhood interventions are very powerful. They are very powerful because they lead people to think it might be worth making a bigger investment here. And just to give you one example, you've got a Torchies nearby here, right? Where did Torchies start? Anybody know? In a trailer in Austin. And how many bricks and mortar stores are they up to by now? They have seven trailers left in Austin, plus their bricks and mortar stores, plus they're in other cities. This is a model that can work. Right? This incremental model in which I can start a business or run an event on the credit card in my back pocket, not on a bank loan, not on any of these more sophisticated mechanisms, but simple, easy interventions. Our next steps. Well, we're headed to documenting all of this work in something called the development plan, a more formal document that will actually be published and available to everyone. We'll come back and present it when it's ready. That document is about three months out, and about three months after that, assuming that document is well received, we'll have a draft of the form-based code, meaning new zoning for the area proposed. We'll have a zoning map, and we'll have districts that we think should apply in this area. We'll have an internal staff review of that, and then eventually public review of those drafts, and it'll go through the formal adoption process uh, through planning and zoning and on up to the council for adoption. So um, that's where we're headed next. There's some imagery here from one of our other form-based codes. I guess the key thing we want to say is that as visual as the rest of this project has been so far, the form-based code will be equally visual. We're not catering to the attorneys. We are catering to people who want to design great buildings in this project area. So we're going to give them visual information we're gonna back that up with what we need to to make the attorneys happy, but to the extent possible, the information is gonna be produced visually so that all of us can understand it, the left-brained and the right brain, right? Finally, you can follow this project on the city's website, uh, fortworthtexas.gov at Westbury. They've got a Facebook page, a Twitter feed for all of those of you who are social media literate. 
And uh, if you're really stuck, you can reach out to the planners. Uh, Artie and Katie are down here in the front row. They've been rock stars this week. Uh, Katie drew some of the drawings. She brought out her old landscape architecture tools and uh, got to work with our team, which was awesome. Uh, Artie has provided me with an immense amount of insight about the area. He's been working here for eight years, and, and uh, it really shows when you start talking about the area. So um, with that, I would like to encourage all of you to come down front, have a little look at the drawings. We're going to set the designers up in various places here so that you can talk to them. Uh, the original material is here. If you're really looking for the new material, this is the residential transition area. And over here are the character areas, sort of the proto-zoning. And then here's the short-term and long-term block study. So if you want to come on down and have a look, I'd be uh, happy to talk to you about them. Thanks very much for coming.